we're going to stroll in at the best city to live in according to Indonesian Association planning experts in 2018. The birthplace of President Joko Widodo, a city of two kingdoms. Woo! The city of art, culture and heritage. Welcome to Surakarta or Solo. Come to the beauty on the own sea Indonesia. Ah, Solo, the city in central Java that could send you back in time. What makes the city special is how she preserves so much its Javanese character. Today, Solo is a bustling economic hub of more than 500,000 people. In the heart of Solo, you'll find the oldest market here, the Pasar Gede Harjonagoro. Why should you go to Pasar Gede? First of all, this place has been around for almost a century. Back then, this place was a trade route and a melting pot between the Chinese, the locals and the Netherlands. <laughs> Nowadays, the acculturation is something you can see, you can smell, and you can taste because Pasar Gede is the best place for culinary adventure. But I won't explore this place long. I'm going to meet my friend Zahra. Mm. Zahra was a runner up in the 2021 Putri Solo pageant. So it's sort of her duty to take me around today. <laughs> That's my friend Zahra. Hi Zahra. Hey, nice, to nice to meet you again. So, now we are eating lenjongan, one of the famous snack in Solo. It's like a snack uh -huh. made of rice flour and a lot of other types of items. Okay, let's do that. Let's try that. Lenjongan is the popular term for a range of snacks made of the many varieties of tubers. They are served with a grated coconut, and a drizzling of palm sugar syrup. You can mix and match lenjongan variants which come in different shape and colors. The stall is quite legendary as well with the origins dating back to the 60s. So where, are, where should we go next? So after this we will try dawat. This is one of the famous too but uh -huh. uh, it is more like soup and oh. ice. Oh so it's like a beverage. Yeah. It's, it's like refreshing is yes, it? Refreshing. Okay let's go there. Zahra said this Dawat stall is President Djokovic's favorite. Since its establishment in the 30s, the Dawat recipe has remained. What makes this place unique is the use of soaked basil seed, which the Japanese would call it Thalassi. For those with a savory tooth out there, Solo has an iconic snack you should try. This is Sosi Solo. So mm -hmm. If you want to try the acculturation between Solo and Western culture, you should try this. Ah, all right. The inside is there is a chicken wrap, like omelet. Ah, okay. Hmm, good, right? It's delicious. Yeah, yeah. You could taste everything. There's onion, mm -hmm. there's chicken. I like the chicken is minced. Yeah. So it's like it's sweet, right? Sweet. You want a heartier meal? Worry not. We're gonna go across the street on Sudirman Street to be exact, which is still a part of Pasar Gede. Second floor features sellers offering heavy meals. What we're gonna have is nasi liwat. Oh, nasi liwat. Nasi liwat is topped with shredded chicken cooked in coconut milk and a spoonful of kumut. 
a thick aromatic coconut cream called. Nasi liwut is served with egg cooked slowly in spices and stir fry chayote. When is the best time to eat nasi liwet? Actually, it's when dinner time, but mm -hmm. we could also eat it at breakfast. We're going to enjoy all the foods we bought outside though. Let's walk to the park in front of the city hall, 170 meters from the market. It only what takes that, two minutes by food. The church. Like yes. Oh, and there's also books. Yes, you could read books here and just enjoying scenery. And there's a lot of people who take picture. Okay. And we can start our breakfast. Yes. On to the Lenjongan. At last, some refreshing dawan. It wouldn't be me, of course, without an incident. Well, that's no surprise at all. Yeah. Okay, you yeah. accidentally spill it again. I accidentally spill it again. Yeah. The taste of it, I cannot explain. But it tastes good. It's complex. Yeah. It's different when you bite a lot of things in here. Mm -hmm. It has a different taste, yeah, right? Yeah. Everything has a different yeah. taste. But then it goes along well together. It's like a harmony in a bowl. After we spend some time catching up, we thought it would be fun to take a bus ride around the city. The double-decker bus started operation in 2011 and quickly became a local favourite. So people took this like on a weekend to have like city tour? Yeah. going to the zoo, but we're going to continue our culinary tour. To get there, we're going to hop on an electric vehicle with a vintage exterior. This is Salad Solo, a fusion of Javanese dish and Western cuisine. This reflects the relationship between the city nobility and European colonists of the Dutch East Indies era. Despite the Japanese name Salad Solo, that denotes salad, the dish is more like an adaptation of braised beef steak in Japanese style, mildly sweet watery sauce. I order something even wilder a galantine, a local adaptation of the French dish galantine. Galantine is stuffed force meat pressed into cylinders. And from what I can observe, people typically would enjoy this dish for lunch since it is fresh and filling, perfect for Solo's daytime heat. Another culture shaping local tradition is none other than the batik. Batik may be iconic in Solo, but actually, batik has a long history and it has something to do with the Gianti Agreement in 1755, which separates Nayogyakarta Kingdom and establishment of the new kingdom, the Surakarta Kingdom. Today we can wear batik however we want, but 
I want to know about the philosophy of batik, the deep philosophy of it, and also the changes that batik had throughout time. And to know more about that, meet Ibu Asti. Welcome to the Naradi Batik Museum. This museum is a private museum owned by Mr. Santoso Dula. First opened in 2008, the museum displays more than 700 curated pieces from the 10,000 strong collections of Donner Hardy's founder. They include pieces from two monarchies, the Surakarta and Manku Negara. Surakarta's Batik development traces its origin to the reign of Pakubono III. To distinguish their kingdom from Ngayogyakarta, the state created motifs and colors called the Gagrak Surakarta. All batik kraton or palace batik had three kinds of color, dark brown, dark blue or yellowish, and then white. It's influenced from the Trimurti, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. For the Surakarta, the brown color or soga over here is darker than Yogyakarta. And then for the motifs, Surakarta motifs from Kasunanan or Mangkunegaran is a little bit smaller. However, there are motifs that are sacred and exclusive to both the royalties of Yogyakarta and Surakarta. Geometrical like this, called parang design. And if the design has a um, linjon, linjon is small design like this, small motifs like this, so we call it parang. Parang is not a sword, but it's a cliff of a mountain. And then inside the palace, those geometrical design, either parang or lereng, it's a forbidden motifs. Only the descendants of the kings or the nobles could born this kind of design. Because in the past, the persons who create the design is Panembahan Senopati, the first king of Mataram in Pleret, Kota Gede, Yogyakarta. Oh, I see. So yeah. the, the process of the inspiration itself, mm -hmm. it took like a long... Yes, of course, a long journey. And why, why the UNESCO declared that Indonesian batiks is intangible cultural heritage? Because it has a philosophical meaning. It's not only how we made it with the hot wax to resist the color, Back then, only the royal princesses and the ladies-in-waiting were allowed to craft batik in an area within the palace called the Kaputren. Hmm, despite its once exclusive status, how come batik grow popular outside the court? The answer lies in the merchant community, or Saudagaran, which saw the prospect in turning batik into a business venture. And the Sudagaran communities famous for their creativity because in Sudagaran communities there is no forbidden motifs. And there's no philosophy as well. No, they don't have the philosophical things. Yeah. As long as the pieces loved by everybody, <laughs> so the point is just like that. Exactly. This is like the music pop. Yeah, this is the music pop. <laughs> From that point on, Batik became accessible to anyone, and ateliers started emerging outside central Java, and even beyond Java. Interestingly, the Second World War, especially the Pacific War, also contributed to the expansions of Batik. In order to survive, the Dutch Indo community established Batik houses with European-infused motives. The most distinctive style is the design with fairy tale motives, Snow White, Red Riding Hood, Hansel and Gretel. The venture didn't last very long though. As they failed, the Chinese merchant took over the business and thrived, particularly in the northern coastal cities like Pekalongan. Chinese indoor batiks are known for their vibrant colors and intricate motifs. The most spectacular is the Tiga Nagari. The red colors in Lassam from the root of Mengkudu to make the blue color to Semarang or Pekalongan or Kudus. If the blue color was made in Semarang, then it not become blue but purple because the pH of every water in the North Coast is different. For brown color to Yogyakarta or Surakarta or Banyumas. 
and still on the subject of batik saudagaran, I'm going to take you to the oldest batik village in Surakarta, which is already in the existence 250 years before the Surakarta kingdom came to be. Meet Mr. Alpha Pabela Priyatmono, the chairman of Lawayan Batik Craftsman Community. Kan bagian dari Kerajaan Pajang ya, mm-hmm. jadi bisa dikatakan sebagai CBD Central Business Districtnya mm-hmm. Kerajaan Pajang. Jadi mm-hmm. di sekitar sebelum tahun 1500, Lawayan sudah eksis. Kita yeah. bisa mengatakan bahwa Lawayan itu merupakan cikal bakal daripada dinasti Mataram. For many years, Lawayan continues to become the center of batik business. They have contributed in funding the Indonesian National Revolution in 1940s, although at a heavy price. Dan inilah yang akhirnya pada waktu serangan 6 jam di Solo, mm-hmm. Lawayan ini termasuk yang menjadi target pengepungan Belanda. Ah. Dan itu bisa kita lihat dari tefak-tefak bangunan-bangunan yang uh-huh. hancur dari dokumen yang kami punya. Ah. Di situ juga banyak juga uh-huh. korban meninggal, korban luka dan sebagainya. Sadly, Tawian has never really recovered from that event. In the 70s, batik production here has waned due to the mass productions of printed batik. Untuk perusahaan kami di sini sekitar uh-huh. tahun 90 itu tutup. Bisa dikatakan 6, 16 tahun ya. Tapi alhamdulillah masyarakat Lawean uh-huh. sadar bahwa Lawean itu mempunyai potensi yang luar biasa. Uh-huh. Kemudian di masyarakat bergerak bersama-sama untuk mengembangkan kampung ini. Uh-huh. Akhirnya dideklarasikan 25 September 2004 itu sebagai kampung batik. Meskipun uh-huh. batik itu sudah ratusan tahun di sini ya. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sehingga uh, kalau dulu kita hanya produksi untuk kemudian ada orang datang beli sekarang kita kombinasikan dengan kegiatan pariwisata. One of the activity you can get your hands on is the batik workshop. Tapi gimana, Mas? Bagus gak? And I have a special teacher today, Dian Primadika, the founder of Batik Tuli. Tuli in English mean death because he has been speech and hearing impaired since birth. He learned batik making from a workshop at his special needs school. Mr. Alpha noticed his potential and now they have been working together for 10 years. And batik has taken him far. Oh, wow! So he drew a batik caricature for one of the guests at some kind of international event in Jakarta back in 2017. And this is uh, the wife of President Joko Widodo. In 2019, President Joko Widodo awarded him a certificate of competence for his dedication to batik craftsmanship. Another Javanese cultural heritage you can see in Solo is a theatrical performance called Wayang Wong or Human Wayang. Originally, it was performed only as an aristocratic entertainment in the palace, but in the course of time, it spread to become a popular and folk form as well. And tonight, I feel very honored because I'm going to take a sneak peek on the preparation they're having for tonight's show. 
for 110 years, Wayang Wong Sri Wedari has stood the test of time. The troupe is a regular performer at Kebun Jeroh Park Sri Wedari Amphitheatre. The building itself is the oldest amphitheatre in Indonesia, built around 1910. Wayang Wong shares many in common with the Wayang Kulit Shadow Theatre. These include similar overall aesthetic and narratives often taken from the Mahabharata and Ramayana epics. Wayang Wong is also accompanied by a large-scale gamelan orchestra. It's a complex performance that combines music, dance and old Javanese literature. In solo, most of the actors and production crew are art school graduates. They are not strictly theatre performers, but rather as civil servants working for the government. Sebagai ikonnya kota, kalau bahasa Jawanya itu memang harus diopening, dilestarikan, nggih, dilestarikan. Memang tujuannya pemerintah kota untuk menjadikan wayang orang Silwedari ini sebagai aset budaya kota Surakarta. Despite being regarded as a classical performance, Wayang Wong is struggling to find an audience. Tahun 2005 ke sini itu sekitar sampai 2010 memang penonton bisa dihitung dengan jari, hmm. tapi karena beberapa usaha kita ya di antaranya juga usaha dari pemerintah Kota Surakarta, di antaranya regenerasi hmm. dan mungkin juga pembaruan-pembaruan di bidang pertunjukannya. Night shows would start at 8. Due to the pandemic, live audience is limited to 20%. The rest can watch it at home through a social media stream. Now let's see what it looks like behind the stage. Actors and actresses are preparing themselves by putting their own makeup and costumes, reciting their lines, or simply walking around in costume to get into their characters. You can get a hint of each character through the makeup or costume they wear. Masks are worn only by demon and monkey characters. The slightly stylized makeup is light for the noble male or female walls. Red face is for the strong and coarse types. The facial makeup on the punakawan or jester usually white. In all, there are 21 roles, each with their own style of makeup and costume. The first act is for the initial incident, something that kicks off the action. From there, the story would keep building up. My favorite part though, is when the Punakawan characters or Jester enter the scene. <laughs> they are the comic relief, the heart of the story. The actors would usually improvise their lines to lighten up the mood. Cultural heritage is central to give us a sense of who we are. It has a refutable connection to the past, it empowers community and it unites us. And for Solo, that one makes them the spirit of Java.